You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is the Christmas murder spree done by teen killers. Now, this was three days of murders in a span of time that is supposed to be filled with cheer. And the worst part is they did it because that is what they believed to be fun, but what we call horrific. By the way, I am posting all month this month with Wicked Winter content and I never do these videos with any intention of causing harm to anybody, any relatives, anybody who knew about the case. I truly just do it to spread awareness for the victims and share their stories. So if that's something that interests you as far as getting to be a part of that, then please make sure you are subscribed down below. And if you want to help me out, all you have to do is thumbs up this video and leave a nice comment down below. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 1992 in Ohio and that December Dayton would have a crime spree occur and it was around Christmas time. Now that Christmas Eve 34 year old Joseph Wilkerson would actually be found in his apartment deceased and he had been bound to his headboard with electrical cords. Now he was found in his home on Prescott Avenue and he was also found to be a General Motors worker which they made a decent amount of money at this time especially in that area but he was also found to have two gunshot wounds one through the chest from a 32 caliber gun and one to the head from a 25 caliber. Investigators could tell that his car was missing as well as in a small TV but they also figured that more was taken as well. But they were a bit preoccupied because that same night, 18-year-old Donetta Goulette was on a payphone on Neal Avenue. And she was a senior at Patterson Cooperative High School. And she was also a mother of a wonderful two-year-old. Now, this payphone was in the neighborhood market in West Dayton. And she would be found on the ground outside of this payphone with five bullet wounds and the casing surrounding her body. Now, witnesses allegedly heard her say, don't shoot me right before the gunshots rang out. And they also said investigators believed that she had been robbed from her gym bag, her jacket, and her book bag, and her gym shoes. Witnesses would also say that they had kind of seen someone fleeing from this area and they were two african-american males who ran to a dark red car then that same day on yuma place a man named jeffrey wright would actually be shot four times in the leg but thankfully he got away he survived he ran to a neighboring house and he was safe however this would not be the end of the deaths, unfortunately. And the next day, it was Christmas Day, December 25th, and 19-year-old Richard Maddox would be found in a car accident on Benton Avenue. And at first, investigators just thought that he had died during this car accident. However, upon closer inspection, they found he actually had a gunshot wound to his head. Witnesses said they had seen two African-American males fleeing from the scene of this car accident. They were standing next to Richard's truck and then they ran off in their own car, but that's all the witnesses really knew. And later that day, a Dodge Shadow was reported to be stolen at gunpoint. Now we move on to the next day, the day after Christmas, the 26th. And that is when a shooting would occur at the Short Stop Mini Market on West 5th avenue sarah abraham was a 38 year old mother of two who was working at this store that was actually owned by her family she was very close to her entire family including her daughter who had just actually drawn her a picture for christmas and that was the present for her mother she took a lot of time on it however her mother the next day would be shot twice in the head at the cash register after it had been cleared out and the bullet casings on the ground next to her matched the ones that were found next to Donetta's body as well. Sarah actually survived long enough to get to a hospital and for five days after that, unfortunately, she passed away at that point. But there was also another customer inside of this store named Jones Pettis and he would be shot twice as well in the hand and in the stomach. Now, his instincts really told him what he needed to do to survive in this moment and thankfully he just fell in 
the ground and he pretended to be dead and this ultimately is what saved him and then, then when he was talking to investigators he actually could tell them quite a bit about what was happening and he said he had been in the store and there was a girl in front of him who was an african-american and she was a little thing he didn't know how old she was she was just a younger girl and she had gone up to the register was wanting this apple juice and didn't have enough money for it so he offered he was always in the store and he offered to just go ahead and pay for it for her the girl was appreciative he ended up paying for it and that is when another male who is also african-american would walk in and would start shooting and that is when jones kind of fell to the floor pretended to be dead but looked and saw that the girl he bought the apple juice for then went with this man and they left after killing Sarah. Now, of course, between this shooting and the other ones that had witness statements, they had kind of a description of what these killers would look like. However, investigators weren't necessarily putting all of these murders and shootings together and saying that they were connected just yet. The investigators said, really the first thing that made a connection for us was the ammunition then you start to worry and you figure out that we've got a person or persons that are probably not going to stop the fact that it was a stranger on stranger crime which is a difficult homicide to solve there was not even a motive although you could argue that robbery is a motive in these cases it really did seem almost like senseless killings now the same day on december 26th two teenagers would actually go missing. Now this was 19 year old Marvin Washington and 16 year old Wendy Cortrell and they would go missing from the store they were working at but no one even knew they were missing at this point because like I said they weren't very on top of things. It is around Christmas season and I'm sure that it's a lot harder to get things done during this time which is very unfortunate because it could have been stopped even sooner but they didn't even know that these two individuals were missing and they would wouldn't be found just yet however the missing car would be that dodge shadow that had been stolen at gunpoint a dayton police sergeant was going down cumbler avenue when he would come across this dodge shadow and of course because they were looking for this car he ran the license plate to make sure it actually fit the car but it came back as not being registered to that certain car so that is when he called up backup and he went after and pulled over this dodge shadow now there was also a whole bunch of different police officers surrounding this car at this point. Four individuals got out at this point. They stood and they put their hands up like they had been instructed to. And the sergeant just believed that these were car thieves that he had caught until he got closer and found the guns inside the car. And he would quickly find exactly what these four teenagers were doing with them. Now, these four people were 19-year-old Marvalis Keen with his girlfriend, 16-year-old Laura Taylor, as well as 20-year-old Heather Nicole Matthews and her boyfriend, 18-year-old Demarcus Maurice Smith. Now, Demarcus was the only one who tried to escape. He ran to a nearby house, but of course, there were so many police officers there that they caught him and they brought all four of these individuals into custody. And immediately, Laura Taylor, the youngest of the group, the 16-year-old, would be visited by a minister at this time. Now, this was not the police doing at all. This was actually a minister who believed that because she was so young, they needed to talk to her. And I will tell you a little bit more about that, about why he visited and about why that makes me so angry in a minute. But when they finally started talking, Marvelis was actually the one who spoke up and was telling them everything they wanted to know. He said that two days before Christmas, so a day before the murders actually started, he and his girlfriend, Laura, were staying in a hotel that cost him $5 a night. And Laura was only 16 at this point, but wanted nothing to do with her family, had dropped out of high school. So she was staying with her boyfriend, Marvelous, and he had just moved there. I don't think he had a job and they were staying in this hotel on very little money and they actually ran out of it. Now, it seemed like when Marvelous was talking about this, he was 
They were more worried about having fun that night, not having money to go anywhere or do anything than they were of having some place to stay. I mean, they really cared more about the adventure and just being exciting rather than being responsible. And this is when Marvela said that Laura allegedly told him, let's get some drama in our lives. And unfortunately, their idea of fun was much different than all of ours. Laura said she knew how to have fun and knew how to get them money at the same time. And she said she knew a man who worked for General Motives or General Motors and made a good decent amount of money and she also said that he often liked to pay for sexual relations and would be more than willing to do so if they wanted to give that to him and she knew exactly how to entice him so with marvelis egging her on she actually called him up and said that they could all perform sexual relations together if he paid them and to make it even more exciting they decided to bring in another girl into the room who ended up being heather matthews now she was 20 years old but she was very much excited about this because she had just been released from jail a few months prior and she was looking to make some money as well the three however had no intentions of actually doing anything with joseph and they said that they tied him up almost immediately and began to ransack his home and this is when they would find his 32 caliber gun in his home and Marvalis would bring it back into the room and put sheets between him and the end of the gun and would shoot him in the chest with it. Heather said that she and Laura came back into the room at this point to see what was going on and they had also brought two 25 caliber guns on their own and Laura saw that Joseph was still alive and decided to take one of those guns, put it to his head, and shoot him with it. They took whatever they wanted from him, including small stupid items like a curling iron and a blow dryer and they ate all his food and they stayed there for hours in the presence of the man they had just killed and they then decided to steal his car and flee and that is when they picked up Demarcus Smith who was Heather's boyfriend to add another person to the mix it's not really sure why maybe Heather wanted to but that is what they did next and headed down Neal Avenue where they came upon Danita Goulet at the payphone. Marvelis allegedly got out of the car and he pointed the gun at her through the booth and said, Merry Christmas, B. And she then said, don't shoot me. And they demanded that she give them her coat and her Fila shoes and all the money she had, which was only 50 cents in her jacket. She did everything that they asked of her and yet they still shot her five times anyways. Then Laura put on her jacket and walked away. Now Donetta's sister actually said she gave them everything that she had. I just wish that they would have spared my sister. Four of them would go back to Joseph's house, the first victim that they murdered to spend the night and they would decide to kind of have a party and they had picked up two other individuals to join their what they were now calling themselves the downtown posse. They wanted two more to be involved with this and that is when Marvin Washington and Wendy Cottrell joined them. Now they were having a little bit of a party but before they would all go to sleep another victim would be targeted now heather had an ex-boyfriend that she had recently broken up with named jeffrey wright and he came into this party and he dragged her into a bedroom by her hair and wanted to talk to her everyone else was having this christmas party and didn't really notice but Heather's new boyfriend, Demarcus, would. And he would chase Jeffrey outside, holding a gun out in front of him. They would get outside and Jeffrey would be shot four times in the legs by Demarcus. But Jeffrey did end up getting away. It didn't seem like, according to the True Crime All the Time podcast, it didn't seem like Demarcus was a very good shot because he was kind of on top of him doing all of this. He had caught up to him, but Thankfully, he did survive and Demarcus seemed like a bad shot. 
Now, before they could catch DeMarcus for doing this to Jeffrey or possibly even talk to Jeffrey about what had happened to him, it was the next morning and that was Christmas Day and Laura would have an idea to go get back at her ex-boyfriend. She thought she could steal some money from him and so she went to his house and lured him outside to the car. His name was Richard Maddox. Now, she got him out to his own car, and so Richard was driving his own car, Laura was in the passenger seat, and they were driving down the road, and I'm not sure what she said to him. Probably they could go out and do something together. Maybe the thought of getting back together Richard was excited about, but they were out driving along. But Marvellis, Heather, and Demarcus were in the car behind them, following them and Richard actually noticed this and began to speed up and when he did Laura put a gun to his head and shot him and that is when she immediately jumped out of the moving car as it careened down the road and hit a tree causing the accident. Later that day, they would start shooting a woman who was airing up her tires. Thankfully though, she did escape but they then took her car, which was the Dodge Shadow. Then it was the day after Christmas, December 26th, and they still weren't done. They wanted to get even more money and they decided to stop at that gas station to see what they could get from the cash register. And that is when Laura walked in first. She would be shown so much kindness by the citizen, Jones. And that is when Marvelis and Demarcus would walk in and they would demand Sarah give them everything from the cash register that ended up to be $44 and they would shoot her twice and then they would shoot at the citizen as well. At this point, the police knew what these killers looked like, but they were having such a hard time finding them because these six people now were changing their license plate, changing cars to make sure that they weren't gonna get caught. They were extremely paranoid and this would lead to them turning on themselves. And they were getting paranoid about two members of the group, Marvin and Wendy. Wendy was also pregnant and they would decide that they were going to tell the police or possibly they already had so they began to question them about it but they still weren't happy when these two were saying we never went to the police so they took them to a gravel pit and they shot them both to death before taking Wendy's shoes and leaving. Now, driving away, Detective Hooper would actually be the one that would spot the Dodge Shadow and that was right after they killed Wendy and Marvin. And this stolen vehicle had these four killers inside and something that I didn't tell you, I told you that they all cooperated when they got out, but during questioning, Marvelis actually said that Laura had told him to just shoot the detective but he had refused. They would bring them in saying, it was a tragic crime at Christmas, a tough time of year. It's sad that we couldn't have got to them sooner. There was no rhyme or reason. There was no pattern. Now, Marvelis was actually wearing two of the victim's clothing. He was wearing a jacket from Donetta and a necklace from Wendy, and he also had a pocket knife from Joseph. Laura was actually the only one who asked for a lawyer, but Heather did tell investigators she would tell them anything they wanted to know in order to get out of the death penalty. She said, I wanted to be like them. I wanted to do what they were doing. She actually said what they was doing. But Heather would end up getting a life sentence, and so would Laura and Demarcus because they were minors at the time. But when it came to Marvelis, it was a different story because he was an adult and unlike Heather, he didn't say he would tell them anything to get out of the death penalty. He would plead guilty, but his defense said that he was suffering from PTSD from the death of his brother that had occurred a year prior to this and that that is what caused him to do this, that he was depressed, that he virtually gave up on his studies and he was introspective and he just wasn't in the right mindset is what they were trying to say. Now, Marvelis's brother had actually been murdered after attempting to rob somebody a year prior, but in the end, Marvelis would be convicted of all five of the murders and sentenced to death. 
He spent 17 years appealing this and he would also write a letter of remorse to his childhood church. But on July 21st, 2009, he would be 36 years old and at 10.36 a.m., he would be executed. Now, he was asked if he had any final words before this and he simply said, no, I have no words. Now, the night prior, he had called his stepfather and he didn't sleep and he had told them he wanted all of his private property destroyed. And that was pretty much it for him. Investigators said that this was pretty much a joy killing and that once these teenagers tasted blood, they couldn't stop. And they said that sometimes on the job, there just isn't a reasoning for why, and that's hard to grasp, but this is almost one of those cases. There is just no reason whatsoever why they did this and it was said this was a game this killing spree was for fun they had taken these people's lives just the way we swat a fly they enjoyed it they lived it it made them somebody now most of this case centers around marvelous because he did get the death penalty and he was kind of the ringleader as some think however i have a different opinion because i think that the other three had just as much to do with it and if they weren't minors probably would have gotten the death penalty and if heather didn't you know make that plea deal but i think that laura is more of the ringleader than anybody and I think that it was because a lot of people said that she was this sweet 16 year old that had a baby face, stood at five feet. They looked at her as this innocent soul, this innocent being, like she had been drugged into the whole thing. She is the one who initiated this whole thing. She shot two victims straight in the head. She would take their clothes and have no remorse for it. She'd actually been kicked out of high school. I said dropped out previously. No. If you look closer, she has been kicked out of high school and refused to live with her parents anymore. After she was arrested, a minister even went to talk to her saying that she was too young to be accused of these crimes as she couldn't have committed them. And I think that that is a true problem. This thinking is extremely harmful because believing that because somebody looks like they couldn't be a monster means they're not. It means that you are being manipulated by them. I think just because you've never been in contact with a kid or a teenager who has shown a dark side doesn't mean that there aren't kids out there who have that dark side. And you guys know from all of my videos this is something I preach so loudly because it's something that I do have experience dealing with and I truly, truly get so passionate about it because I'm not sure that people want to grasp that. And in this case, I think Laura was just as much the ringleader. But I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Also, do you think Marvellis's brother and his death had something to do with why Marvellis did all of this? Possibly some PTSD from it? You know, PTSD is something I kind of want to talk a little bit about for a moment, if that's okay with you, because it's not talked about enough, and it's not something that just happens to veterans. They go through such horrific things, and I'm by no means, you know, putting that down at all. They truly are the strongest people, but there are also people who live normal lives who have PTSD, and it's not something that's told to people unless you go to, you know, therapy or you get help for it. Nobody tells you that that's something you can have just from what you're going through. Now, this is trauma that occurs in your brain after having a prolonged period of extremely stressful environments or situations and experiences. But this doesn't have to be a prolonged period. You can actually also get this when you endure a state of psychological shock from something that you have been through. And this truly changes how your brain works forever or for quite a long time until you get the proper help and even then th there's not a true fix now not only can you be triggered which is something that i think social media has made kind of a, more of a joke about but it's not a joke to be triggered when you are truly suffering from ptsd and you were triggered this is something that makes your body shut down completely because of say a sound or a situation that resembles the situation you were in when you first kind of 
got that PTSD and it can make it so horrific it can put you right back in that time period where your brain is telling you that you were in danger even if the sound just resembled it and it has nothing to do with it. It's not something that you can really level with with your brain. It's just your brain is telling you and you're in danger and you are saying okay. Now this can cause a huge amount of hypervigilance where you can be super anxious and super just aware of all of your surroundings all the time because you're worried that something is going to trigger your PTSD or that the situation is going to come back into your life and you're going to have to deal with it again. And it's a true fear that people with PTSD live with is that their state of what they were traumatized by is going to forever have a hold of them and they are not going to be able to do normal things or even function properly because of it because they are constantly in a state of panic. I think about it as like in those movies when the actors are in like an apocalypse or in an action movie and they're constantly being chased they're constantly fighting for their life even if there's not you know the zombie standing right next to you or the monster behind you ptsd is something that you kind of create those scenarios already so you constantly feel like there's somebody next to you or at least that's how it feels in my opinion so like those actors that are constantly fighting constantly worried constantly stressed i'd love to hear your experiences with it down below although i hope that none of you are going through that honestly because it is something that is really tough to work through because it can cause things such as nightmares avoidance anxiety i mean a multitude of different issues now there are therapies there are medications to make you feel normal but it's hard to live life in general when you are constantly stressed out about it but I do want to say if you have any of those symptoms or if you do have PTSD don't let it stop your life because your triggers may seem like they are there to ruin it and to make you feel like you can't live but that is not the case because they don't rule you, you rule them because you continuously live and fight every single time that you do get triggered, that you are anxious, you continue and that makes you a powerful person. It does not make you weak in the slightest. I see your strength, I know your strength and I'm freaking proud of you for it and for continuing on this journey that is life, even if it's a bit harder for you than some people. I want to point out that I in no way am saying that PTSD is what made Marvelous murder or that it makes anyone else. I think something that in a lot of these videos I get the occasional comments saying how dare you say that this disorder leads to a killer. I am no means am ever saying that because it I believe it's a multitude of different things that have to occur in your brain, different levels of trauma, you know, exposure to different kinds of trauma, different mental illnesses that are coming together. So I am never ever ever saying that oh because somebody has this mental illness it means they could be a killer or they are a killer. So if you ever come across one of my videos and it made you feel that way, I'm so sorry, but I just want you to know that that is not ever the case. I'm not sure if Marv Ellis even had PTSD. I'm not going to diagnose him, but it could be something that being in a state of shock from his brother's death could have done. Um, I'm not sure. He wasn't close to his brother and near his brother at the time. That doesn't mean anything though because, you know, a bond like two brothers could be very damaging to your psyche when something happens to them. But I do believe more than anything is if Marvellus didn't meet Laura, none of this would have happened because I think together they were quite deadly and I think Laura on her own probably would have been as well, given a few years for her since she was only 16 if she didn't have an older boyfriend. Now, Danetta, who was killed by these monsters, her kids actually went to her sister, Rhonda, who has said, I grieve for my family, but I continue to grieve for the other victims' families and also the people who are incarcerated. Anybody's life can go to the left or to the right, so I do think about them 
very often. She also works for the Montgomery County Victim Witness Division and does her best to help others who are in the same situation that she was put into. And I really wanted to spread the victim stories. You guys know I'm not all about talking about the killers. I don't think that they deserve that at all, but I know that it's quite interesting to understand why and hopes that we can eventually stop them in the future. And I wish that we knew a little bit more about Laura's past because I think that the different traumas she went through could have told us a lot about why she is, how she is, and how we could, you know, prevent this in the future. But I just think everyone together was quite a deadly combination. And unfortunately, this occurred and it had to occur so close to a wonderful holiday that some of us celebrate. And yeah, those are just days, but they're days where we shouldn't have to worry for once that something bad is going to happen. Because I think that's the problem. We're also anxious because the world is scary and we never know when we're going to have to deal with something. And we don't know if we're going to be strong enough for it. But I hope you know that I have all of your backs and I truly, I believe in your strength. And I know that we can get through anything together. So I hope that that was a decent video for this kind of more Christmassy episode and I do hope you have the most Merry Christmas in the world. I don't know exactly when I'm posting this but have the best Christmas day ever. Remember it not about the presents whatsoever. It is about the love. It is about the people you're surrounded by but if you don't have anybody just know that I'm here for you and you know watch this video if that makes you feel better. If you want to put me on while you eat dinner it doesn't have to be a super family filled present filled day i hope you have the best day and don't ever forget to speak up your voice is powerful enough and i love you to absolute pieces okay bye